created the heaven, singing about the blood. You know, it's still the blood this morning, always has been, always will be. And I'm glad I got saved by the blood of the Lamb one day. Yeah. We sing them songs a lot of times that are sins under the blood. You know, my sin's gone this mm -hmm. morning. Their sin was under the blood in the Old Testament. The Lamb of Jesus came, suffered, bled, and died. Our sins is gone once right. we got Amen. saved. Right. Good to be here this morning. Got your Bible, be looking to the book of Luke, <coughs> chapter number 7. <coughs> the book of Luke, chapter number 7. We'll begin reading verse number 36. We get into this this morning. You'll find that Jesus is dealing with the Pharisee here. He's going to be dealing with a sinner woman. And last week we looked at the book of Luke chapter number 6. Remember last week we looked how the Lord used a parable in chapter number 6. And he made a comparison there. We talked about those two builders last week. A man that built his house on the rock. And when the storms came, the winds blew the water, his house stood. And there was another man built his house on the sand. When the storm came, remember there was a disaster. His house was washed away. And we said the Lord used divine, divine comparison there in that parable between these two men. And the only difference in them was their foundation. And you'll see here in chapter 7 this morning, the Lord's going to use another parable here. And he's going to be making a comparison again between these two debtors in this chapter. And he's going to use these two debtors and compare this Pharisee and this sinner woman in this chapter. And you'll find early on in this chapter, Jesus is having to deal with these Pharisees. They're always questioning everything that he does. A lot of these Pharisees were Jews. They were real strict. Most of them were in what they were doing. They were good people. They lived right. They lived clean. But they didn't believe Jesus was the real one. They always wanted to question what he was doing, the good works he'd done. They always wanted to bring everything he was doing down. And you get in verse 6 here, in verse 36, in Luke chapter number 7, we begin reading. And these Pharisees had been questioning Jesus. There's one of them pops up and wants to take him home with him and find out some things. The Bible said that one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with them. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and then wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the oil. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he was a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them. Give them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love me most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to him he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with oil. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved me much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they, they that sat at me with him began to say with themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you once again to thank you for this another opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, mercy, and grace. And thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for Calvary. And I pray, dear Lord, you'd help us here this morning. Lord, I need your help. I pray you'd clear our minds this morning, dear Lord. You know we've got a million different things going through our head. 
And I pray you'd help us here for a little while today. And I pray for all these that are sick. I pray for those who are in the hospital. you touch them this morning. Touch their families. I pray you'd comfort them. And dear Lord, just touch all those involved in these different things. And dear Lord, I just want to thank you again for loving me. And pray you'd help us this morning that someone might be able to get some help here. Dear Lord, help us to say things that are plain this morning. People can draw from. And Lord, we just need you. And we'll thank you. Because in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We read here in Luke chapter number 7. You'll see this begins to deal with the sinner woman. It begins to deal with this Pharisee. Then on down in the chapter, Jesus begins to give them this parable. It makes a comparison between this man and woman. And there's really a big difference between this man and woman when you get into this chapter. You know, we said last week those two, the foundation was the difference. But you're going to find in this sinner woman and this Pharisee, one of the biggest things you're going to find a difference in in their lives. One was convicted and one was unconvicted. And it makes a big difference when a person gets under Holy Ghost conviction, they're going to seek God. And when a person's not under conviction, they're not going to seek anything but their own ways, their own moral values, that's all they're going to do. I want you to notice the Bible talks about here in verse number 37. The Bible said, And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. Now the Bible calls this woman a sinner. Now we're all sinners this morning when we're born into this world. Nothing but the grace of God is all the reason we're saved today. We're all still sinners, but sinners by grace. And the Bible said this woman was a sinner. And the best I can find about studying this text out the background of it, you read after a lot of different commentators on this, and a lot of men seem to believe that this woman could possibly have been a prostitute or a harlot. I mean, there's some things going on in this chapter she could have possibly been. The Bible even said in verse 37 that she brought an alabaster box with her when she came into the Pharisee's house. And the reason a lot of men feel like this woman could have possibly been a harlot or a prostitute Back in this day, all those harlots and prostitutes carried alabaster boxes with them. And the reason they used these boxes, you know, this was perfume. It smelled good. It had a strong smell to it. And back in this day, this was one of the highest priced things in their economy. This box of alabaster, when it was totally full, it was very valuable. They say these harlots would take this uh, perfume in this box they would even rub it on the walls in the city trying to, trying to draw men's attention, trying to bring them toward their home. They would put it all over the walls in their houses. And let me say again, this, this box of alabaster was something that was really valuable. Say it was, they tell me anything you read or look at, said it was worth a whole year's a worth of pay back during this time, during this economy, if that box was full. Now here's a woman, when you look what she's doing, She's giving up something that's probably maybe her livelihood part of it. And you look also, here's a woman that's giving up something that's cost her a whole lot. But I want you to notice her humble spirit here in verse 38. The Bible said, And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did weep with them, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the oil. Now notice how humble this lady is where she's standing at. Bible says she's a sinner. And I believe this woman's probably got so much humbleness about her. Realizes what she really is. And she realizes who she's coming to meet. The Bible says she's standing behind her. You remember we, we preached a few weeks ago, a month or so back about Mary. When she got at Jesus' feet. She was bowed in front of him, worshiping, weeping back during that time when we preached on her. But here's a woman doing something totally <coughs> different. She has got down behind Jesus. I believe this woman is so humble, she's realized what kind of sinner she is. And she don't want to get in front of him and face him. And she's got down behind him. But you think about the humbleness. The Bible says she's weeping. And she's standing behind him. But you notice something about this Pharisee in verse 39. Notice what he's done. The Bible said, Now when the Pharisee which had bid him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he was a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is, 
that toucheth him, for she's a sinner. You're to write down beside verse 39 a bad attitude right here. Now here's we've got a man that he's not even got enough guts to speak out what he's what he's thinking. Bible said he spoke within himself. He's mumbling what he's thinking. You know, he didn't even think that there was one in the room could hear what he was saying. He didn't realize the one he was looking at, I could, uh, could understand what he was thinking. He didn't realize there was one in the room that already knew his thoughts because he knew what was in his heart. Yeah. And that was a man by the name of Jesus. This old boy didn't have enough guts to look at him and say, what are you doing with this sinner woman? So he went to mumbling these things. And you notice in verse 39, He's pretty much looking at him and saying, well, Jesus, if you was really a preacher or if you was really a man of God, you'd understand what kind of woman this is. You know what Simon didn't understand? He didn't realize what kind of man Jesus was. He didn't care who reached out and touched him. He didn't care if it was a prostitute. He didn't care if it was a drunk or a harlot. He didn't care if it was a thief or not. He didn't realize what kind of man that he had brought into his house. Now you don't find this Pharisee here shedding any tears anywhere. You don't see him bowed down at Jesus' feet. You don't see him showing any love at all toward the man by the name of Jesus. I mean, this old boy is pretty much proud. He's stuck on himself. He thinks he's better than other people. You know, Simon's problem was that, that Jesus didn't know what manner of woman this was. He didn't realize what manner of man Jesus was. I mean, he didn't realize who he had in his house. And you notice in verse number 40, Jesus knew what was in Simon's heart. I mean, you notice that what he says in verse 40, the Bible said, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. I mean, could you imagine Jesus is getting ready to say something about Simon? I, I've often wondered, I wonder if old Simon didn't think in his heart and his mind, Jesus is getting ready to brag on me. He's getting ready to tell this sinner woman and everybody in the house what, could, what a good man I am. I believe old Simon probably got to thinking, well, I don't cuss. I don't run with the world. I don't drink. And I believe old Simon was probably thinking, I fast twice a week. I go to the temple regularly. I pray regularly. I kept the law. But you know, I believe old Simon may have got a may have got a, a, a something that he never thought was coming toward him when Jesus began to tell him what he really was. Probably got the biggest shock of his life when Jesus began to speak. Now Jesus does something in a wonderful way right here again in chapter number seven. He begins to make a comparison with these two tears. Now you'll notice down in I guess in verse number down about verse number forty one. The Bible said there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now Jesus begins to make a comparison right here again between these two debtors. And he's going to use this to try to show Simon what kind of man he really is. You know, we need Jesus to show us sometimes what kind of people we really are and open our eyes. Now I want you to notice Simon here. Here's Simon and here's this woman. And the Bible says there's two debtors. And the Bible said that one owed 500 pence and the other 50. You know, in reality, these both are in debt. In, in this parable that we're looking at, in reality, they both owe one debt that they cannot pay. Now, in reality, both Simon and the sinner woman, when you look at them, they're both sinners by birth, by nature, and by choice. Now, you notice what's going on here. And both need the forgiveness of God. And you notice verse number 42, the Bible said, and when he had nothing to pay, maybe you ought to underline that right there. That's me and that's you this morning. Bible said when they had nothing to pay. You know, we ought to just think about that this morning. You know why so many saved people get excited sometimes and maybe get stirred up about their salvation? Man, there was a day when we had nothing to pay. Man, there was a day and time in order to remind you this morning that somebody paid a debt, man, that I didn't know. Man, somebody paid a debt one day that I couldn't pay. Man, you ought to stop this morning and underline that right there. The Bible said and when they had nothing to pay. The Bible even went on to say when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them. 
Now, when you look at that word frankly right there, that means verily. That means truly indeed. No questions asked, straight out. This debtor frankly forgive both of them. I don't understand why I would have done it. One owed 500, he forgave me. One owed 50, and he forgave me. And he forgave both of them of their debt totally. Now you notice what Jesus says to Simon there in verse number 42. He asked him a question. He said, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave both of them. Tell me therefore which of them will love me the most. Ask him a question. Who loves them the most? Here's one that owes 500 he can't pay. Here's one that owes 50 and he can't pay. And the creditor forgive both of them. He just flat out said, I'm going to forget about this. I'm going to cancel the debt. Now in my mind, Jesus has asked this man a question. Who would love him the most? In my mind, I guess I'd probably think the one that owed the most might love him the most. I mean, in our minds, we'd probably think that. You know, the one that owed 50, God forgive just as much. Now you know, a lot of times, we'll criticize people a lot of times for praising God. You know, a lot of times you better stop before you do that. You might better check and see who that person is and where God brought them from. Man, there's some folks, man, it seems like they got a whole lot more to thank God for. I mean, I know this morning that God saves one sinner just like He does the other. But man, you ever stop and thought? Man, there's some folks out there that's been wicked or I don't know what, been into everything in the world. And there's some people never been into anything. But it still took as much blood to save that wicked one. Or that one that's never been in any things it does anybody. It's let the, the, when you get to the cross, man, it's level there. The ground's level. I mean, some folks a lot of times will look at these folks. You know, I've noticed in my Christian life, some of these folks have been in a whole lot of stuff down through life. And I'm not belittling anybody or downing anybody. But I've seen some of these people get saved. And it seems like they're a whole lot more appreciative of what God's done for them. So man, don't you knock somebody when they get to praising God. Don't you run them down when they get to praising God. Man, I, I've seen some of these folks that were drunk. Some of them maybe were thieves. And God done something for them. Man, they just seem to be more appreciative. Don't seem like me and you are real appreciative anymore of what God's done for us. Man, He's going to keep us out of the same hell as you did then. Seems like cause some of us may have never been into this or been into that. May have never been in trouble with the law or anything before. We're not as preaching as some of these folks are a lot of times. I don't know why it is though. It seems like maybe that some of those folks, their life had so, such a dramatic change when Jesus saved them. You know, you ever stop seeing some of those folks, man, they'll get it sometimes. They'll get a dose of the king help us and they want to brag out him everywhere they go. Man, some of that crowd like that, man, they've got a higher trigger. They want to glorify God. Man, you ever notice, man, that when folks like that get saved and somebody else gets saved, they expect God to change them the same way He should. But we look at some of these people sometimes like they went crazy or something or another. Man, you ever seen some of them that's been in everything? Man, when they get in, they get in. They're not part-timers anymore. Man, they want to be there every time the house of God's open, every time the doors is open. Man, I wonder about some of this crowd that just pops in and out here and there. What have they really got? Man, a good dose of salvation will keep you in the house of God. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You know, I'm not saying that God saves one person more than the other. He don't. When you're saved, you're saved just like anybody else. But there are some that appreciate Him a lot more. I mean, you just stop and look around. Common sense will tell you that. But you know, we really need to be appreciative this morning. You know, I was thinking last night when I was looking over this and comparing these two. I was thinking it probably been 22, 23 years ago probably back Used to go on a lot of mission trips and stuff. And man, we was down in Jamaica one time. Now they're building some churches. Me and another preacher one Sunday morning. You go down there, you better get ready to preach. It ain't like it is here on Sunday. You're going to preach in three or four churches back to back. 
And man, they like it. They pack it out. Man, another preacher had been down there. We, well, man, we walked one, that one morning several miles. Me and him did back and forth to churches. Preached all day long. We come back in that night. We was all sitting around talking. Having a good time disfellowship and talking about the day that we'd had. And there's a black preacher come through that night. I mean, he's a preacher. We got to talking to him. Man, he loved the Lord, knows something about God. He got to asking us what we preached on that day. We talked about it a little bit. I can't remember me or one of the other fellows asking what he preached on that night and where he preached that. He looked back at us and said he preached on the getting used to it syndrome. Man, I got to sitting there and was going through my mind, what's he talking about? He, he got to looking at us. He looked back at us and said, fellas, I don't know about you white folks. He said, well, we got to got used to it syndrome down here. He said, that's what I preached on tonight. He said, we got saved and we got used to it. He said, we've been born again and we got used to it. He said, we don't have to go to hell and we've got used to it. He said, man, we got a place to go to the house of God right now and we've got used to it. He said, man, I, he kept talking to us. He said, I used to be a drunk. That old preacher did. He said, I used to do this, that, and the other. He said, but I've got used to it now. And man, I got to thank him. Man, he looked at us and said, I don't know, but you white, white folks have that kind of problem. Man, I got to thinking about that that night. Man, we've got the got used to it syndrome right here in the United States. Man, we're saved. We don't have to go to hell. And we've got used to it. Man, we forgot about what God's done for us, man. We've got that syndrome that old preacher was talking about down there. Man, I don't want to get over what happened to me back in 1980 that night I got saved. Man, I'd like to go back every now and then relive a little bit of that. Man, you can't go back and get saved again. But we ought to never get over what happened to us the night we got to Calvary. The night we got to Jesus' feet. The night we became a child of a king. He rolled our sins away and gave us more peace than we've ever thought about. Man, we've got over that. Man, he asked old Simon there in, 40, in verse 42, which of them loves him the most? Then he goes down in verse 44 through 48 and he starts talking to Simon. But he uses this woman for an illustration. You look what he said in verse 45, down in about verse number 44. The Bible said that he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. He goes on in verse 45 and says, Thou givest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with oil. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. He gets down to that woman and says her sins are forgiven. You may say this morning, Preacher, did he forgive her because she loved him? Now he forgive her because he loved her. I mean, he's trying to make a point here to sign. She was thankful for forgiveness and she loved him back. Now you notice nowhere in this text did this woman ever say, I love you, Jesus. But let me say her actions prove she loved you. You know, a lot of times your actions are more than words are. How you treat people, how, what you do for them, what you do for Jesus. Now you notice in verse 49 and 50 down here, the first time he spoke directly, this is the first time he speaks directly to the woman. The Bible said, And they that said it meet with him began to say with themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. You know, it's always been faith. The first time he speaks directly to her, he says it's your faith that saved you. You know, it's always been great through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. Now Jesus is using this divine comparison here in Luke 7. And I want you to notice Simon the Pharisee squeaky clean. And we possibly got a harlot right here. Possibly got a woman that's doing things she shouldn't be doing because she's a sinner. 
Now Jesus uses this parable of the two debtors to make a comparison. One owes 50 pence and one owes 500. Huh. You say, well, what can you draw from this? Give you three things here real quickly that you can draw from. There was an unpayable debt here in this chapter. You know, both of these men paid a debt they couldn't pay. And the Bible said when they had nothing to pay. Man, let me remind you again. You had a debt that you couldn't pay one day. Man, you, 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 you ought to just say, Man, I had a debt I couldn't pay one day. I can't get over that. I thought about it all night. I can't get past that. Trying to get deeper into this. You might say this morning, I'm a good person. I'm a Baptist. I'm a fundamentalist. I'm a good moral person. I mean, I've been going to church all my life. But you know, I'm here to tell you this morning, if you've never been a guilty sinner, run to Calvary. And man, if you've never got like this woman was right here and realized you had a debt, Man, you got a debt you couldn't pay. Religion couldn't pay. It. Myself good couldn't pay. It. But man, ain't you glad, man, you, the happiest day of your life was the day the Holy Ghost showed you that you was a lost sinner. And there wasn't nothing you could do about this debt, but man, there's one that could pay. It. Maybe you remember back over in the book of Daniel, chapter number 5. Remember Daniel was talking to Belshazzar over there and he told him they're weighed in the balances and are found one. Daniel said, Belshazzar, you're in God's scales. You know, you know how, how scales work. You can go into maybe a produce place or somewhere and they got these scales. And man, they got to keep putting them weights on this thing to get it balanced out. So they know how much you're buying or how much you owe. Man, you ever thought and said, Daniel, sit on this one side's holiness. On this one side's the glory of God. On this one side's the righteousness of God. On this one side's the sovereignty of God. On this one side's the eternity of God. On this side's the awesome power of God. But couldn't you maybe, Daniel, looking back to that other side, said, man, there's my darkened mind. There's all these wickedness spirits that I've got. Here's my feeble flesh and here's my destiny headed to hell. How could somebody that's that way down on this one side ever balance that scale on God's side? You ever thought about that? I mean, how could those scales ever get balanced? Somebody's got to pay the debt. Somebody's got to pay the price. Let me remind you, man, over 2,000 years ago, man, that somebody come up the back side of Calvary. Man, them scales on his side was so high. And them scales on my side was way down here and nothing I could do about it, so much wickedness. But man, ain't you glad there's one stepped up and paid that debt. Man, there's one brought that scale up to where he was at. Man, his name's Jesus this morning. Man, I got justified that day and got glorified. Man, you ought to stop this morning. I'm going to do something for you every now and then. In order to make us want to run a little bit, shout a little bit. Man, in order to make us want to get a little happy. If there's one paid a debt that I couldn't pay. You're looking at old boy who ordered been hell a long time ago. Deserved nothing but hell. But man, he looked down right under Holy Ghost conviction. He said, I'm going to pay your sin debt. He said, oh buddy, you don't have to go to hell. All you've got to do is come to me. Man, I'm glad he's put down balances and check one day. Old Simon the Pharisee, he's Mr. Clean. He fasted twice a week. He prayed and kept the law. But he doesn't realize he's a lost sinner. He didn't realize he's the lost sinner Jesus was talking about here in chapter 7. He didn't realize he is the one that was bankrupt sin. Now notice the difference here between Simon and this woman. Said we begun, one's convicted and one's unconvicted. Now unconvicted Simon the Pharisee, he's got Jesus down in his house. He said, I'm clean, I'm dressed right. You know, you can always tell a Pharisee that all, they're always criticizing everybody else. They're always talking about, how, about everybody else's faults but never admitting theirs. They can't see their faults. But I... 
I, I mean, you, you think about this illustration this morning. I've heard men of God do this. I, I've heard a lot of them preach against different things. Heard one here a few months back. Man, he isn't preaching against TV like crazy. I mean, he isn't preaching against it every way coming and going. But he's got internet in his house. He's got internet on his phone. And man, I've got both of them. Yeah, I've got blocks on them. I've got internet in my house. I've got TV. Let me tell you something. That internet's about a whole lot more wicked than TV is. Man, you can get a hold of anything you want to on there if you ain't careful. I mean, it's as it's a good a tool as we've got anymore for information, but you better be careful how you use it. Heard one of preaching about against the TV like that like crazy. Then he's got the internet. I, I mean, how can you do things like that? I'd be like a man of God get up preaching and get smoking, then go out and get him a big chew. I mean, what's the difference? I mean, you got folks that'll do things like that. Man, they're, they're nothing but Pharisees when they do this. Man, I had a, a preacher friend back years ago. He remembered about him telling about this in life and about Brother Billy Kelly. So we remember have heard of Brother Billy back years ago, preached all over these mountains, camp meetings, and everywhere evangelists. He was a big old man, weighed about 450 pounds. I mean, you never heard a man could sing like he could. I mean, he pretty much eat himself to death what he done when he, when he died. But he was preaching one time, got to preaching on, about, on these preachers about them wanting to pastor a church full time, but wanting to stay on the golf course all the time. Got to preaching against golf. And there ain't nothing wrong with playing golf as long as you keep it in proper perspectives. But what got Brother Billy, they was one of the preachers during that service hopped up and looked at Brother Billy and stopped him while he was preaching and said, won't you preach on blood and you're fat? And he said he learned something right there. Man, you can be a Pharisee and not even know it. you got to be real careful how you're doing things. Here's old Simon, he was unconvicted. He said, I'm clean, I've got Jesus in my house. But he don't realize he's a bankrupt sinner. Old Simon don't realize what's going on. But you've got this sinner woman right here. She knows she's a sinner. Man, and she knows she's bad. I mean, you think about this. All sin is bad. Adultery is bad. Fornication is bad. Lying is bad. Stealing is bad. But you know the only sin I find in this Bible that God said, he, I mean, He hates all sin. But He nailed one of them down that He said He hated, and that's pride. You know, the worst pride I've ever seen is probably religious pride. You watch that crowd that makes fun of somebody getting happy over salvation. Nine times out of ten, it's that Pharisee crowd. Yeah, they're clean. They live good. But man, they want to run everybody else down. They've never been broken by God, never realized their sin. Now Simon here, he, he's a man that's not been broken over his sin. He's looking at this woman and saying... You know, the old Simon ought to have been broken looking at this woman and saying she's in the same shape I mean. Simon's never been broken. I mean, he's still living his sin. And Jesus comes to Simon and said, Jesus, pretty much in saying, man, you've not done some things for me that you should have done. Simply put, when he comes to his house, Simon's unconvicted and he's not aware. You know, you are to stop this morning. If you're saved today, you are to wave your hand, man, and you are to just thank God for not leaving you in the condition you was. Right. Not leaving you unconvicted, but bringing you under Holy Ghost conviction. Now, Simon had seen Jesus for what manner of man he was. He wasn't worried about what manner of woman this was. Mm -hmm. Now, you go to the book of Isaiah, you don't have to turn there, but I ran across something there last night. Old Simon ought to have been humble because Jesus was in his house. Right. But you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 1, chapter number 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. And you'll find that Isaiah's preaching right there. He's rebuking, he's exhorting, doing it with all authority, doing what God told him to do. But if you remember now the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah said, Woe unto me. In every chapter, the first five chapters was his point. Then when you get to chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. 
He heard those seraphims saying, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of His glory. And when they spoke, the doorposts moved. Isaiah changed his message then after he saw God. He said, Woe unto me, woe is me, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell among a people of unclean lips. I'm telling you, if you ever see him for what he is, you'll get off your throne and put him on the throne this morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, Isaiah seen him for what he was. Now here's convicted. You think about this woman. Man, she must have had a strong desire to meet Jesus. This woman wasn't invited to this meeting at this Pharisee's house. I mean, he wasn't going to invite her. You think about it. Here's a Pharisee having a special meeting with Jesus. How many Pharisees you think would have went out and invited a sinner woman to come to his house when Jesus was coming? You know, I believe her desire was so strong. She said, I'm just going to go. You know, she comes in the Pharisee's house and all she's got is an alabaster box. That represents her profession, represents a year's wages, but she realizes she's nothing. You know, when the Bible said when she knew that Jesus said it meet in the Pharisee's house, I believe she realized that was enough of the invitation to get her there when she realized Jesus was there. Ain't you glad one day you heard about Jesus being in the house now she came in the house and she was so ashamed she wouldn't walk in front of him. She went right behind Jesus. Now here's the Pharisee on the other side. He's in Jesus' face arguing. But here's this woman, a sinner. She's broken. She's behind him. And the Pharisee's not broken. He's trying to learn Jesus. So. Now stay with me. I'll be down here in just a minute. This woman's behind him crying. And you know, I believe she's probably saying, I know I'm an awful sinner, and Jesus wants you to forgive me. And I want you to see some things she does here in a minute. This kind of looks like an older sin. She's bowing down, she's weeping. And apparently she's got long hair. What's the Bible say the woman's hair is? The Bible says that the woman's hair is her glory. That's her beauty is what the Bible says. I didn't say that in the Bible. It says it's her glory. She's taking her glory and she's wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair. Now there's the difference. She's convicted and Simon was unconvicted. You know, an unconvicted man or woman will sit on a pew listen to singing and preaching and go home the same way they came in and look at us like we're crazy. You take somebody that's been convicted, you know, they'll fall at Jesus' feet like this woman did right here. Man, there's an unpayable debt. The best day of your life was the day you realized, man, there was an unpayable debt. Yeah. You look, there's an unmerited deed done right here. When they had nothing to pay, frankly, forgive both of them. That one man owed 50, the other owed 500. What have they ever done to deserve to have the debt lifted? Nothing. Neither one of them have done, done anything. Man, it had to be love. It had to be mercy. Man, whoever this creditor was, he said these boys are going to live like this the rest of their life in misery if I don't forgive them. I'm just going to cancel their debt. I'm going to pay it in full. I'm going to wipe it away. And I want you to notice here, he never spoke to Simon, you're forgiven. But he spoke to this little lady, you're forgiven. Your sins, which were many, they're gone. Your faith's done the work. Man, I still remember that night he took, the, took me to Calvary, that old rugged cross. That old echo this morning about him forgiving us. Your debt's paid in full. I mean, man, you ever read the book of Philemon? About that little old slave boy over there. You ever read that story? You know, it's a one-chapter book, just as the, the book of Jude is. You know, these two books have got a special purpose. They introduce or get you ready for the next book. Jude prepares you for the book of Revelation. And fly Philemon introduces you to Hebrews. You say, what's the book of Hebrews do? It talks about the great shepherd who paid a price and redeemed his people. Man, it talks about a place that that shepherd's going to take us to. You know, God used Philemon to introduce Hebrews. You say, well, who is Philemon? 
Man, it was a story of a runaway slave that winds up in prison. And guess who he gets hooked up with in prison? A man by the name of Paul. And I don't believe Paul probably cared that this old boy was probably chained to him. I believe he may have told Paul about his story, what had went on in his life. And I believe Paul probably told him about the story that happened to him on the Damascus Road. I believe old Paul gets out the pen and paper and begins to write a letter. I mean, you read the book of Philemon, man, he's wrote a letter to that slave master. And he's told him that he's met up with Philemon, his slave, and his God. He said, I want to tell you something. I told him about Jesus and he got saved. And he, he tells that slave master over there, man, he's a brother now. He got saved by God's grace. No, Paul said, sir, whatever he owes, you put it on my account. Can't you imagine old Paul saying, man, I was a runaway slave one day telling Philemon. I was a runaway slave to sin. Can't you imagine old Paul maybe look at him a week in a little bit? Said Jesus wrote a letter to the Father. Can't you imagine Paul looking at Philemon and said, I was locked up in sin's prison. Had a debt I couldn't pay. And he signed and pardoned me and said, debt paid in full. He said, put that on my account, saved by the crucified one. Mm -hmm. Man, couldn't you imagine old Philemon getting happy there about that? Man, there's an unselfish demonstration here in chapter in Luke chapter 7 too. Let me show you this and I'll be done. This Pharisee's not been moved yet. He's still looking in Jesus' face. He's not moved. Jesus said, Simon, when you came to my house, I ain't going to take time to read verse 45 through 50 again. But Jesus said, Simon, when you came to my house, you didn't even take water and wash my feet. That was a custom back in those days. When people came in your house, they wore sandals back in those days. Their feet got dirty. They smelled. It was a custom for the person that lived in the house there who owned it. Just take water and simply wash this, 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 this friend's feet. He went again also there and told uh, Simon, you didn't wash my feet. Jesus said, Simon, this woman's got something you know. She's got tears. She washed my feet with her tears. He even said, Simon, when you came to my house, you didn't kiss me on the cheek. That was another custom back in that day. I mean, the homeowner would kiss the person on the cheek, welcome them to come in. He said, Simon, look, she's kissing my feet. There's a big difference. Jesus said, Simon, I came in and you didn't even know my head was all. That was a custom. Oil back then was a cheap thing. They would take oil and put on their head a, a, maybe somebody passing through just to freshen them up. Jesus said, Simon, you didn't recognize me with the cheapest thing you got to put on my head. He said, but look at this woman. Well, she, she wasn't using oil. But she was taking alabaster, the most expensive thing, and putting it on my feet. Simon says, you won't give me the cheapest thing to put on my head, but this woman's giving me the most expensive thing you got. You know, I don't want to be like, I don't know about you this morning, but I don't want to be like Simon. I want to take my best and lay it down and give it to him. Man, this woman was giving him the best she had. He said, I frankly forgive you. How many of you think about that this morning? That woman was rubbing the best she had on Jesus' feet. Think about what she was doing. She got behind him. And you know when she rubbed that on his feet, she had that all over her hands. You ever thought when Jesus got up to walk away, she followed, she smelled just like him. You know, you ever get to where Jesus' feet sat? And you really get serious and get to rubbing on his feet and get to praying right. You'll get to walking like this woman and smelling just like Jesus. I mean, when Jesus started off, people said, well, she smelled just like you. How many people look at me and you say, well, you smell just like you. I mean, man, we had a debt we couldn't pay. Jesus made a comparison here between a woman that was convicted and a man that was unconvicted. A Holy Ghost conviction makes a big difference. It, it'll let you see yourself for what you really are and who you are. 
And let you see Jesus for who He really is. He ought to be high and lifted up. You know, I'm so glad this morning He paid a debt one day I didn't know. Man, if it was up to me, I'd been in hell a long time ago if it took me to pay that debt. But ain't you glad this morning He paid that debt? I want you to stand here.